and unfortunately, it will also expose our troops to unnecessary death and injury. Mr. President, our generals understand this. Our generals understand this. General Abizade said clearly in his testimony before the Armed Services Committee that more U.S. troops will not solve the security problem. In fact, he said they would only slow the process of getting Iraqi security forces to take more responsibility. The Joint Chiefs of Staff unanimously opposed this escalation. In fact, according to the recent news reports, the Pentagon has warned that any short-term mission may only set up the United States for bigger problems when it ends. A short-term mission could give an enormous edge to virtually all the armed factions in Iraq, including al-Qaeda's foreign fighters, Sunni insurgents, and Sunni and Shiite militias, without giving an enduring boost to the U.S. military mission or to the Iraqi army. And it's not just the advice of his military commanders in Iraq that the President is ignoring. It's the bipartisan council of the Iraq study group, appointed for the very purpose of defining a new course. Mr. President, what kind of arrogance so willfully kicks to the curb the work product of two former Secretaries of State Republicans, a former Attorney General and Chief of Staff Republican, a former United States Senator and member of the leadership Republican, and a group of moderates, former Secretary of Defense and others respected for the moderation of their views on foreign policy and security issues. What kind of arrogance avoids almost all of those recommendations and moves in a different direction? Rather than change course, this administration chose to ignore the generals. In fact, it chose to change the generals. The folly of this escalation is so clear that we have a bipartisan responsibility to do everything in our power to say no. I asked my colleagues, is there one colleague here who believes that 21,500 troops is going to pacify Iraq? Is there a colleague here who believes that 100,000 troops will pacify Iraq? It's not enough for Congress simply to go on record as opposing the President's reckless plan. And that is why I support the resolution introduced by my colleague, Senator Kennedy, that requires a new congressional authorization, which is appropriate, Mr. President, because the prior authorization only applies to the weapons of mass destruction and to the threat that Iraq poses to us, based on the presence of Saddam Hussein. This is a new Iraq, and is an Iraq with a civil war. And the Congress of the United States has a responsibility, an obligation, a moral obligation, to make certain that if our troops are going to go and fight and die from each of our states, we stand up and be counted as to what the force structure to be, as to what their mission should be, because this administration has proven unwilling to get it right. Stopping this escalation, however, is not enough. I believe that Congress has to provide a responsible exit strategy that preserves our interests in the region, preserves our ability to continue to protect the security of the United States, and that honors the sacrifice that our troops have made. I believe those are tests that we need to pass. Six months ago here in the Senate, we stood against appeals to politics and pride and demanded a date to bring our troops home, to make Iraqis stand up for Iraq and to fight a more effective war on terror. But while we lost that roll call, I still believe there's the right policy to put in place to demand benchmarks, to demand accountability, and to leverage action. That's why I will again introduce legislation slightly different this time, in order to try to offer a comprehensive strategy for achieving a political solution. I believe that the strategy I'll set forth is the best way forward for America and for Iraq. We have to find a way to end this misguided war and bring our troops home. And the legislation, while protecting all the interests I described, and I believe we can do that. I believe the Iraq study group's recommendations can form the basis for finding a bipartisan way forward. Many of those proposals, which are consistent with proposals that some here in the Senate have long advocated, are incorporated in the legislation I will offer, including launching a major diplomatic initiative, enforcing a series of benchmarks for meeting key political objectives, shifting the military mission to training Iraqi security forces and conducting targeted, 
counterterrorism operations, maintaining an over-the-horizon presence to protect our interests, supported by a concerted effort to disarm, demobilize, and reintegrate the militias, which must be undertaken by Iraqis. This legislation includes an additional provision that I think is a critical component of the strategy. Mr. President, I know a lot of colleagues were nervous about setting a date. Fewer are as nervous today. But I believe that there is a way to require the President to set that date, negotiate that exit, a way to do it constitutionally and also within the context of the reauthorization. And I think that uh, that is not an arbitrary deadline. In fact, the Iraq Study Group report effectively sets a goal of withdrawing United States combat forces from Iraq by the first quarter of 2008, or within approximately one year. This date was based on the time frame for transferring responsibility to Iraqi security forces set forth by General Casey and on the schedule agreed upon with the Iraqi government itself for achieving key political and security objectives. The President even said that under that new strategy, responsibility for security would be transferred to Iraqis before the end of this year. That is how unarbitrary it is. The President has said it, our generals have said it, the Iraqi study group has said it. Now, Mr. President, I want to repeat this because it's important, because it's continually distorted. We all want success. But you have to examine the realities of the road to success. An effort that combines diplomacy with smart deployment of our troops is the only road to success. And I asked my colleagues, where is the diplomacy? Many of us can remember under a Republican president, Henry Kissinger, shuttling back and forth day and night, working to bring an end to the Vietnam War. Many of us can remember Jim Baker, in the, at the beginning of the decade, 90s, when he took 15 trips to Syria alone, and on the final trip got President Assad to actually agree to support what we were doing. That's diplomacy. We don't have that kind of diplomacy. We lack even a special envoy there, day to day, hour to hour, leveraging the Arab League, leveraging the United Nations, working with the UN Firm 5, working with the neighbor countries doing the kind of significant, heavy diplomatic lifting that our sons and daughters who are dying deserve. As our combat troop levels wind down, Mr. President, we can have sufficient forces to confront the Sunni insurgency. We can still continue to prosecute al-Qaeda, but our, our, our core security interests the security interest of preventing another terrorist attack on our country. Those interests lie where our troops can still play a positive role in confronting Sunni insurgents and their al-Qaeda allies. That will happen when we focus on Al-Ambar province, not Baghdad. Mr. President, it is time for Iraqis to assume responsibility for their country. And that's not just a statement. This has been four years. 300,000 troops are trained. When I talk to the military people I talk to, they don't, they, don't, they don't tell me training is the problem. They tell me motivation is the problem. Those 300,000 troops are not prepared to die for an Iraq yet. And they are mostly local militia and or local tribe affiliated, which is their true allegiance at this point in time. We need a timetable which forces Iraqi politicians to confront this reality. Americans should not be dying because Iraqi politicians refuse to compromise and come together. If they're not willing to do it today, Mr. President, with thousands of people dying around them, with this kind of sectarian violence, what will make them more willing to do that in a year? They are using the security blanket of American presence in order to avoid making those compromises, and we need to understand that and get about the business of leveraging the compromise that is the only solution to what's happening in Iraq.